Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Conference on Catastrophic Risk 2020. I'm Catherine Rhodes, I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk and I'd like to thank you for joining our conference, whether you're attending live, watching the pre-recorded sessions or viewing the sessions online after the event. For those of you unfamiliar with us, the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk is an interdisciplinary research centre at the University of Cambridge dedicated to the study and mitigation of risks that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse. We have just passed the five year point since our first researcher joined, and now we have around 25 research staff. And as well as our research in particular risk domains, we are focusing on the development, refinement, and implementation of new methods, tools, and approaches, both for conducting research on this class of risks and also for effective engagement and outreach to help shape positive change in their management and mitigation. One of the Centre's founders is Lord Martin Rees, and the conference draws on key themes from his 2003 book, Our Final Century, inviting expert response on the book's conclusions and reflections on the growth and development of the field of global catastrophic risk research. Following these brief welcome comments and provision of some technical information about the conference, my colleague Simon Beard will give an overview of the conference themes, and a keynote talk by Lord Rees will kick off the conference. The conference forms part of the activities of our new A Science of Global Risk Research Programme funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Templeton were the funder of our main programme, managing extreme technological risks over the centre's first few years, and we're very grateful for their continuing support for our work. The project is investigating how an integrated science of global risk contributing to safeguarding the long-term future of humanity can be developed. To be effective, such a science needs to be methodologically rigorous and creative, focused on risk management and policy formation, and accessible to and applied by a broad community of stakeholders. The series of Cambridge conferences on catastrophic risk provide a key opportunity for us to engage with insights and developments in aligned fields, and to continue building the community engaged in efforts to manage and mitigate this class of risks. The conference was initially planned to take place over two days in Cambridge in April. With our move to an online format, we have also given the conference a different structure, with the core content running for around three hours a day over four days. Appreciating that those timings won't work for everyone, in addition to our live content, we are posting pre-recordings of the main presentations on the platform in advance, and will release recordings of the sessions online after the event. To promote interaction, the contributed talks have been kept relatively short, leaving more space for engagement and facilitated discussion within the live sessions. You can contribute questions and comments to the panel using the session Q&A on the right hand side of the session pages. It is also possible to post questions in advance as well as during the live sessions. We also have some artists providing drawings inspired by the talks and conference themes, and we hope that you will take some time to look at their work over the course of the conference. There are reflective sessions at the ends of days one and two and a social session at the end of day three, as well as opportunities to use the Hoover platform and associated app for networking. And we encourage you to connect with other participants via chat during the breaks and before the start of each day's sessions. You can also add information to your profile, for example, to note topics you are particularly interested in discussing during the conference. If you have any questions or need assistance navigating the platform, please contact our conference team via the Ask the Organisers option on the community page. I would like to thank the speakers for continuing to engage so positively with us as we've navigated various changes to the event over the last few months and for putting in significant work in advance that has enabled us to have these pre-recorded materials. I also want to thank Annie Bacon and Claire Arnstein who are providing the administrative support for the conference. Colin Ramsey of Dragonlight Films, and the Centre's researchers who have formed the organising committee and who are chairing many of the sessions. As in our previous conferences, we are deliberately engaging speakers and participants who provide a combination of those with a central or primary focus on existential and global catastrophic risk research, and those from aligned fields of research, policy and practice, the contributions of which are vital for our collective efforts to address such global challenges. I'm really excited by the range of speakers and the topics on which they're presenting, and I'm confident that while considering whether humanity will make it through this century can at times be disheartening, we will all be able to find points of insight and inspiration to continue to motivate our efforts towards ensuring humanity's potentially far longer term future. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the conference.
Hello, and once again, welcome to the Cambridge Conference on Catastrophic Risk 2020. I'm Simon Beard. I'm the Academic Programme Manager here at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. And I wanted to say a few words about what we're trying to achieve with the Cambridge Conference on Catastrophic Risk generally, and with this conference in particular. The Cambridge Conferences on Catastrophic Risk are conceived of as being the single biggest meeting place for all the different people who work on global catastrophic risks and existential risks around the world. And as such, we invite a very wide diversity of researchers to join us here as panelists and participants. And that we find stimulates a lot of productive and useful discussions. And we hope you're really going to enjoy the experience of being here and sharing this time with us. The goal of this conference in particular is to revisit the work of Martin Rees, and in particular his 2003 book, Our Final Century, which is one of the first really credible scientific works to bring together all the different kinds of global catastrophic risk and consider how they're related to one another. I've recently completed some historical research into the development of the field of global catastrophic and existential risk studies, and I'll be sharing the link to that in the text in relation to this video. From it, I really came to appreciate just how diverse the many different perspectives that people have brought to this field are, and how vital it is that we all listen to and respect the different points of view that we share. Roughly speaking, I saw that there were five different fields that have really fed in a lot to global catastrophic risk as it is in 2020. And I'll just briefly run through them before turning to the themes from Martin's book and how they relate to these. The first field that has contributed a lot to the field of global catastrophic risk studies is actually science fiction. This goes back really to the 19th century and to the very early days of science fiction with authors like Mary Shelley and Lord Byron being very concerned about global catastrophes and even the potential for human extinction. One of the first works to consider human extinction from a secular point of view was Mary Shelley's 1826 novel, The Last Man, which ima imagines all of humanity being wiped out by a plague, leaving only one survivor. The first non-fiction book about global catastrophic risk is probably Isaac Asimov's 1977, A Choice of Catastrophes, in which he goes through all the different ways in which first the universe, then the solar system, then Earth, then humanity, and then our civilization might perish. However, it wasn't long until credible scientists joined science fiction authors in raising concerns about technological threats and the future of humanity. Early concerns about the risk of nuclear weapons were soon joined by worries about overpopulation and environmental decline, biological weapons and the development of new biotechnologies, and of course, artificial intelligence. By the 1960s, all four of these threats were being taken very seriously by scientists around the world although they tended to focus on one particular threat at a time. Martin's work as a scientist who was willing to bring together all of these different concerns and consider them side by side was therefore very instrumental in formulating the idea of existential risk as a unified field of concern and study. Other groups who played a pivotal role in this were transhumanists, who saw a bright future for humanity if only we could develop the right technologies and the right sorts of social organisation to gain maximum benefit out of them. However, inherent in transhumanist hopes were also transhumanist fears that within these technologies, humanity was serving the seeds of its own destruction. Therefore, many transhumanists such as Nick Bostrom and Anders Sandberg, amongst others, became early pioneers in the field of existential risk studies. In the last 10-15 years, their ranks have been greatly swelled thanks to the work of effective altruists, whose concern was well, how much good that they could do, and what the best ways to bring about the best outcomes were. While early effective altruists were chiefly focused on concerns about development and later animal suffering, a realisation that our impact on the far future is one of the biggest effects that any of us can have, quickly followed and the influx of not only money, but skills, talents, and intelligence that they brought into the field has seen a remarkable transformation and growth. The final group of scholars who I see as contributing significantly to the fields of existential and global catastrophic risk studies are those who see humanity's future and the risks facing us as lying predominantly in the systems that we create and their vulnerability to collapse. This is a field that traces its roots back to the 1970s and groups like the Club of Rome, 
but it's really taken off in the last five years or so with an increased realization that environmental threats like climate change and loss of biodiversity are no less urgent than the technological concerns that are raised by prominent scientists and transhumanists. So I hope that you'll be able to see all five of these strands of research in the panelists and in your conversation with other participants. And I hope that we can all listen and learn from what each other has to bring. I certainly feel that the conference has been put together in such a way that we're going to see a lot of these different perspectives in the panels as we consider different themes that emerge out of Martin's wonderful book. In the first panel, we're going to consider some of this historical context, and in particular, which concerns about human extinction and global catastrophe were dominant before the early 2000s with the work of Martin Rees, Nick Bostrom and others. Two key concerns that we'll be looking at are the threat of nuclear weapons and of overpopulation. But these raise important issues about global governance and power structures and how these relate to existential risk more generally. In the second panel tomorrow, we're going to look at one of the biggest and boldest claims that Martin made in his book. The notion that the chances of human civilization making it through the 21st century unscathed are no better than 50-50. How credible is a prediction like this? And what are some of the alternatives that people have made to it? Then we're going to turn to considering human extinction and global catastrophes against the backdrop of the long-term future of humanity, both in terms of the future centuries and future millennia or even longer. In the second half of the conference, we'll be turning to some of the main drivers of global catastrophic risk as we see them here at CESAR. We'll start by looking at one of the important distinctions that Martin draws between risks of error and risks of terror and ask whether there isn't actually a third driver somewhere between these two, global injustice. Acts and systems that are contributing directly to global catastrophes because they are in the interest of current elites or because they are systematically ignoring the interests of some of the worst affected groups both in terms of environmental and technological risks. Next, we're going to look at the question of who does research, who does technological development, and what effect that can have on the risks involved and the benefits and how those are distributed. Thirdly, we're going to look at what Martin calls the background level of risks, risks to humanity that originate in our environment, both terrestrial and celestial, including volcanoes and asteroids, and whether there are significant threats in this field that are currently being overlooked. And finally, we're going to look at humans' impact on that environment and the growing threat of global catastrophic environmental risk and how existential risk scholars might think about and respond to this. I'm really excited to get started on some of these discussions, and I hope you are too. But before we start with any of the panels, I'd like to invite Martin Rees to give his own perspective on our final century, what he thinks that intervening time has taught us about global catastrophic risk and whether there's anything that he'd like to update and change about his perspectives as presented in that book. Over to you, Martin. I'd like to add my welcome to that which you've already had to everyone who has joined this uh, virtual meeting. It deals with crucial issues because make no mistake, COVID-19 should not have struck us so unawares. Why were even rich countries so unprepared? It's because politicians and the public have a local focus and downplay the long-term and the global. They ignore Nate Silver's maxim, the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. Indeed, we're in denial about a whole raft of emergent threats to our interconnected world, which could be devastating. They're the theme of this conference. Some, like climate change and environmental degradation, are caused by humanity's ever heavier collective footprint. We know them well, but fail to prioritize countermeasures because their worst impact stretches beyond the time horizon of political and investment decisions. It's like the proverbial boiling frog, contented in a warming tank until it's too late to save itself. Another class of threat, global pandemics and massive cyber attacks, for instance, are immediately destructive and could happen at any time. The worst of them could be so devastating that one occurrence is too many. 
and their probability and potential severity is increasing. And some natural events, earthquakes, volcanoes, and solar flares have an unchanging annual probability unaffected by humans, but their economic and human costs get greater as populations grow and global infrastructures become more vulnerable. COVID-19 is a wake up call. It reminds us of the urgency of the issues this conference addresses and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. I'll start however with a flashback. The most extreme threat for my generation when we were young was nuclear annihilation. Kennedy put the probability of a war over Cuba in 1962 as between one in three and evens. His defense secretary McNamara, when older and wiser, said we were lucky. And we all learned later of various false alarms and other lucky escapes during the 1970s and 80s. Many would assert that nuclear deterrence worked. In a sense it did, but that doesn't mean it was a wise policy. If you play Russian roulette with one or two bullets in the cylinder, you're more likely to survive than not. But the stakes would need to be extremely high or the value you place on your life inordinately low for this to be a wise gamble. But we were dragooned into just such a gamble throughout the Cold War era. For my part, I wouldn't have chosen to risk a one in three or even a one in six chance of a catastrophe that would have killed hundreds of millions and shattered the historic fabric of all our cities, even if the alternative were certain Soviet dominance of Western Europe. And of course, the devastating consequence of thermonuclear war would have spread far beyond the countries that faced a direct threat, especially if nuclear winter were triggered. Nuclear war still looms over us. The only consolation is that there are about five times fewer weapons and a lower alert than the US and Russia deployed during the Cold War. But there are now nine nuclear powers and a higher chance than ever before that smaller nuclear arsenals might be used regionally or even by terrorists. And work done at Caesar shows that command and control systems are getting more vulnerable cyber threats. Moreover, we can't rule out later this century a standoff between new superpowers that could be handled less well or less luckily than the Cuba crisis was. Nuclear weapons are 20th century technology, but this century has brought surges in new technologies, bio, cyber, and AI, whose implications this meeting will focus on. And the backdrop to all our present concerns is a world where humanity's collective footprint is getting heavier. There are twice as many of us as there were in the 1960s, about 7.8 billion, all more demanding of energy and resources. But the number of births per year worldwide peaked a few years ago and is going down in most countries. Nonetheless, world population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by 2050. That rise is partly because most people in the developing world are young, they yet have children and they live longer, and partly because the demographic transition hasn't happened in, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa. Despite doom-laden forecasts by the Club of Rome and Paul Ehrlich, food production has kept pace with rising population. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not overall scarcity. To feed 9 billion in 2050, we'll require further improved agriculture, intensive, low-till, water-conserving and GM crops, and maybe dietary innovations, converting insects, highly nutritious and rich in protein, into palatable food and making artificial meat. To quote Gandhi, to be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Population projections beyond 2050 are uncertain. It's not clear whether there'll be a global rise or fall. But if for whatever reason, families in Africa remain large, then according to the UN, 
that continent's population could double again by 2100 to 4 billion, thereby raising global population to 11 billion. Optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain, but it's the geopolitical stresses, the inequalities between countries as well as within countries that are most worrying. As compared to the fatalism of earlier generations, those in poor countries now know by the internet, etc., what they're missing. They are embittered by their unjust fate and emigration is easier. It's a portent for disaffection and instability. We'll hear later from a distinguished expert, Malcolm Potts. Wealthy nations, especially those in Europe, should urgently promote growing prosperity in Africa and do this not just for altruistic reasons. And another thing, if humanity's collective imprint on land use and climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. Biodiversity is crucial to human well-being, but preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right over and above what it means to us humans. To quote the great Harvard ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. And Parthidas Gupta, CESA's chairman, is currently preparing a report on the economics of biodiversity for the UK, US government, which hopefully will be as influential as the Stern report on climate. So the world's getting more crowded. And it's another firm prediction. It'll gradually get warmer. In contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under discussed, though it is still sadly under responded to. The fifth IPCC report presented a spread of projections for different assumptions about future rates of fossil fuel use and associated rises in CO2 concentration and the need for urgent action was highlighted in its update published in 2018. Under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out later in this century, really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap. But even those who accept this differ in how urgently they advocate action today. The divergences in view stem from differences in economics and ethics, in particular, in how much obligation we should feel towards future generations, whether we discount long-term concerns or feel we should pay an insurance premium to reduce the risk to future generations. But to insert a bit of good cheer, there's one win-win roadmap to a low carbon future. Nations should accelerate R&D into all forms of low carbon energy generation and into other technologies where parallel progress is crucial, especially storage, batteries, compressed air, pump storage, hydrogen, etc., and smart grids. The faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner their prices will fall, so they become affordable to, for instance, India, where more generator capacity is needed and where the health of the poor is now jeopardized by smoky stoves, burning wood and dung and where there would otherwise be pressure to build coal-fired power stations. It's good that Cambridge Zero is a flagship university project to promote this goal. And it would be hard to think of any uh, aspiration for young engineers better than trying to provide clean and affordable energy for the entire world. We should be evangelists for new technology, not Luddites. Without it, the world can't provide sustainable energy nor nourishing food and good health for an expanding population. But many of us are anxious that it's advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with it. And the technology's misuse can give us a bumpy ride this century. Advances in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines and antibiotics offer prospects of containing natural pandemics. But the same research raises what's my number one worry 
the prospect of engineered pandemics. For instance, in 2012, groups in Wisconsin and in Holland showed it was surprisingly easy to make the influenza virus both more virulent and more transmissible. To some, this was a scary portent of things to come. Such gain of function experiments can be done in principle for coronaviruses too. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing is hugely promising, but raises ethical concerns and worries about possible runaway consequences of gene drive programs which wipe out species as diverse as mosquitoes or gray squirrels. Regulation of biotech is needed, but I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide. Any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. Whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without large scale special purpose facilities that are easily monitored, biotech involves small scale dual use equipment. And the global village will have its village idiots and their idiocies can now cascade globally. The rising empowerment of tech savvy groups or even individuals by biotech and by cyber tech as well, will pose an intractable challenge to governments and aggravate the tension between freedom and privacy and security. These concerns are relatively near term within the next 10 or 15 years. What about 2050 and beyond? On the bio front, you might expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes which determine key human characteristics. And second, the ability to synthesize genomes that match these features. If it becomes possible for biohackers to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, then our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. And what about another transformative technology, robotics and AI? DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero computer famously beat human champions in the games of Go and chess. It was given just the rules and trained itself by playing against itself over and over again for just a few hours. Already, AI can cope better than humans with complex, fast changing networks, traffic flows or electric grids. And the Chinese have enough data and processes power to have an efficient planned economy that Marx, Marx could only dream of. And it can help science too. Protein folding, drug development, and perhaps even settled whether string theory can really describe our universe. And the societal applications of AI are already ambivalent. The incipient shift in the nature of work have been addressed in several excellent books by economists and social scientists. We need a system that taxes the robot owners to create jobs for carers, for young and old, teaching assistants, etc., to replace jobs in Amazon warehouses and call centers. AI systems will become more intrusive and pervasive. Records of all our movements, our health and our financial transactions will be in the cloud managed by some multinational quasi-monopoly. If we're sentenced to a term in prison, recommended for a surgery, or even given a poor credit rating, we would expect the reasons to be accessible to us and contestable by us. If such decisions were delegated to algorithms, we'd be entitled to feel uneasy, even if presented with compelling evidence that on average, the machines make better decisions than the humans they've usurped. The arms race between cyber criminals and those trying to defend against them will become still more expensive and vexatious. So many think that AI, like synthetic biotech, already needs guidelines for responsible innovation. And CSER and its sister institutions have produced some important reports. Ethical tensions are already emerging when AI moves from the research phase 
to being a potentially massive money spinner for global companies. It's of course the speed of computers, which allows them to learn on big training sets. But as Stuart Russell has emphasized, learning about human behavior, acquiring common sense, won't be so easy for them. It involves observing actual human beings in real homes and workplaces. And the machine will be sensually deprived by the slowness of real life. It's like watching trees grow is for us. And robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't jump from tree to tree like a squirrel, but sensor technology is advancing fast. But we don't know how fast. And this leads to a digression. It's always harder to forecast a speed of technological advances than their direction. Sometimes it's a spell of exponential progress, like the spread of IT and smartphones in the last decade. But in the longer term, it's more like a sigmoid curve. Two examples. From Alcock and Brown's first transatlantic flights in 1919 to the first jumbo jet was 50 years. But 50 years later, we still have the jumbo jet. And it was only 12 years from Sputnik 1 to the moon landings. But 50 years later, the moon landings are still the high point of human spaceflight. So experts are getting less optimistic about how quickly we'll have some innovations, for instance, stage five fully driverless cars. And the iPhone 24 may not be too different from the iPhone 12. But let's look still further ahead. What if a machine developed a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or go rogue? Futuristic books by Nick Bostrom and Max Tegmark portray a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the internet of things and pursues goals misaligned with human interest or even treats humans as an encumbrance. Some AI pundits take this seriously and think the field already needs guidelines, just as biotech does. But others like Rodney Brooks, inventor of the Baxter robot, regard these concerns as premature and think it will be a long time before artificial intelligence will worry us more than real stupidity. But be it as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury's out on whether they'll be idiot savants or display superhuman capabilities, and whether we should therefore worry more about breakdowns and bugs or about being outsmarted. The futurologist Ray Kurzweil, now working at Google, argues that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones, an intelligence explosion, the singularity. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, where he predicted that humans would transcend biology by merging with computers. In old style spiritualist parlance, they'd go over to the other side. We then confront the classic philosophical problem of personal identity. Could your brain be downloaded into a machine? If so, in what sense would it still be you? Should you be relaxed about your original body then being destroyed? What would happen if several clones of you were made? These are ancient conundrums for philosophers, but practical ethicists may one day be moved to address them. But Kurzweil is worried that his nirvana won't happen in his lifetime. So he wants his body frozen until that time's reached. A company in Arizona will store your body in liquid nitrogen so that when immortality is on offer, you can be resurrected and your brain downloaded. And two of our distinguished Oxford colleagues have gone in for this cryonics. I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. But of course, biomedical research on aging is being seriously prioritized. Will the benefits be incremental or is aging a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would 
plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. Um, but it may happen along with human enhancement in other forms. Indeed, it's at least on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modification and cyborg techniques. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design would take only centuries, thousands of times faster than Darwinian evolution. This is the game changer. When we admire the literature and artifacts that have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf of thousands of years with those ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligence is a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have an algorithmic understanding of how we behave. And this incidentally is one issue where I quibble with Tony Ord's excellent book. Because of these rapid changes, it doesn't seem realistic to have a centuries long conclave to formulate plans stretching for hundreds of millennia. Back now to the nearer term. The historical record reveals episodes where civilizations have crumbled and even been extinguished. This was done famously by Jared Diamond and Luke Kemp and others here are cataloging more such events. But the difference now is that our world so interconnected that a catastrophe couldn't hit any region without its consequences cascading globally. And by the way, pandemics not only spread fast and spread globally, as they didn't in the past, they caused far worse societal breakdown. European villages in the 14th century continued to function even when the Black Death halved their populations. In contrast, our societies would be vulnerable to serious unrest as soon as hospitals were overwhelmed, which would occur before the fatality rate was even 1%. And as likewise huge societal risk and even reversion to anarchy from cyber attacks on infrastructure. What if the electricity grid or the internet failed this month, for instance? That's why we need to contemplate collapse, societal or ecological, it would be a truly global setback. The setback could be temporary. On the other hand, it could cascade and spread so devastatingly and entail so much environmental or genetic degradation that the survivors would never regenerate a civilization at the present level. But this prompts the question, could there be a separate class of extreme events that would be curtains for us all, fully existential catastrophes that could snuff out all humanity? This has been discussed in the context of biological or high energy physics experiments, which create conditions that have never occurred naturally. Can scientists credibly give assurances that their experiments will be safe? We can offer huge odds against the sun not rising tomorrow or against a fair die giving a hundred sixes in a row, because we're confident we understand these things. But if our understanding shaky, as it plainly is, on the scientific frontiers, we can't really assign a probability. So biologists should avoid creation of potentially devastating genetically modified pathogens or large scale modifications of the human germline. Cyber experts are aware of the risk of a cascading breakdown in global infrastructure and innovators who are furthering the beneficial use of advanced AI, they should avoid scenarios where the machine might take over. Many of us are inclined to dismiss these risks as science fiction, but given the stakes, they should not be ignored, even if deemed really highly improbable. On the other hand, innovations have an upside too. Application of the precautionary principle has an opportunity cost, the hidden cost of saying no. We should be mindful of that as well. And by the way, the priority that we should accord to avoiding these highly unlikely truly existential disasters depends on an ethical question that's been discussed by the philosopher Derek Parfit, the rights of those who aren't yet born. Consider two scenarios. 
Scenario A wipes out 90% of humanities. Scenario B wipes out 100%. How much worse is B than A? Some would say 10% worse. The body counts 10% higher. But Parfit argued that it might be incomparably worse because human extinction forecloses the existence of billions, even trillions of future people. And indeed of an open-ended post-human future spreading far beyond the earth. Some philosophers criticized Parfit's argument, denying that possible people should be weighted as much as actual ones. They'd say we want to make more people happy, not to make more happy people. And even if he takes these naive utilitarian arguments seriously, one should note that if aliens already existed, terrestrial expansion by squeezing their habitats might make a net negative contribution to overall cosmic contentment. However, aside from these intellectual games about possible people, the prospect of an end to the human story would sadden those of us now living. Most of us, aware of the heritage we've been left by past generations, would be depressed if we believed that there would not be many generations to come. But I think it's worth considering such extreme scenarios as a thought experiment, because we can't rule out human-induced threats far worse than those on our current risk register. Indeed, we have zero grounds for confidence that we can survive the worst that future technology could bring. These issues are a mega version of the issues that arise in climate policy, where it's controversial how much weight we should give to those who will live centuries hence. It also influences our attitude to global population trends. But I'd like to conclude by reverting to nearer term concerns. Opinion polls show, unsurprisingly, that younger people who expect to survive most of the century are more engaged and anxious about long term global issues. Their campaigning is welcome. Their commitment gives grounds for hope. What should be our message to them? It's surely that there's no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world where all enjoy a lifestyle better than we in the West do today. We live under the shadow of new risks, but these can be minimized by a culture of responsible innovation, especially in fields like biotech, advanced AI and geoengineering, and by reprioritizing the thrust of the world's technological effort. So we can be technological optimists. But the intractable politics and sociology does engender pessimism. The scenarios I've described, environmental degradation, unchecked climate change, unintended consequences of advanced technology could trigger serious, even catastrophic setbacks to our society. And of course, most of the challenges are global. Coping with COVID-19 is plainly a global challenge and the threats of potential shortage of food, water and natural resources, and transitioning to low carbon energy can't be solved by each nation separately, nor can the regulation of potentially threatening innovations, especially those spearheaded by globe spanning commercial conglomerates. Indeed, the key issue is whether in a new world order, nations need to give up more sovereignty to new organizations along the lines of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the World Health Organization, etc. Scientists have an obligation to promote beneficial applications of their work and to warn against the downsides. Universities should use their staff's expertise and their convening power to assess which scary scenarios, echo threats or risks from misapplied technologies can be dismissed as science fiction and how best to avoid the serious ones. Politicians focus on immediate threats like COVID-19, but they won't prioritize the global and long-term measures needed to deal with climate change and biodiversity unless the press and their inboxes keep these high on their agenda. Science advisors to government have limited influence except in emergencies, but they can enhance their leverage by involvement with NGOs, by blogging and journalism, and by enlisting charismatic individuals and the media to amplify their voice. Politicians will make wise decisions, but only if they 
feel they won't lose votes thereby. And to give an example, uh, Michael Gove, not a specially enlightened minister, when he was minister for the environment, introduced legislation against non-renewable drinking straws. He knew that the public cared about that, and the public cared because millions had watched David Attenborough's program, Blue Planet 2, which showed albatrosses returning to their nests and coughing up for their young, not the long for nourishment, but bits of plastic. That's an iconic image for ocean purification, just as the polar bear on the melting ice flow has been for climate science. Well, I'll end with another flashback, not just the 1960s, but right back to the Middle Ages. For medieval people, the entire cosmology from creation to apocalypse spanned only a few thousand years. They were bewildered and helpless in the face of floods and pestilences and prone to irrational dread. Most of the earth was terra incognita to them, but they built cathedrals constructed with primitive technology by masons who knew they wouldn't live to see them finished. These vast and glorious buildings still inspire us centuries later. Our horizons in space and time are now vastly extended, as are our resources and knowledge. But we don't plan centuries ahead. At first sight, it seems a paradox, but there is a reason. Medieval lives played out against the backdrop to change little from one generation to the next. So they were confident that they'd have grandchildren who would appreciate the Finnish cathedral. But for us, unlike for them, the next century will be drastically different from the present. We can't foresee it, so it's harder to plan for it. And there's now a huge disjunction between the ever shortening time scale of social and technical change and the billionaire time spans of biology, geology, and cosmology. Spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its patches are anxious and fractious. Their life support systems vulnerable to disruption and breakdown. But there's too little planning, too little horizon scanning. We need to think globally. We need to think rationally. We need to think long-term empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science alone can't provide. And that is the motive, I suspect, for many of us attending this meeting and the discussions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Martin. Um, that was a great introduction to many of the themes that are going to recur throughout the conference. We're now moving into a live discussion session. Um, so I'll just make a note to attendees that um, please keep your microphones muted throughout this, this discussion session. The questions and answers will come in via the moderator. So just add them into the chat, either um, through the session Q&A or the chat at the side here, they'll all be drawn in. So Martin, what I'd like to do is uh, start with the question that's come in from one of our postdoctoral researchers, Clarissa rios Rojas. She's, uh, well, it's a two part question. So the first is knowing with all your experience in global risk, whether you could share some highlights of the times that Caesar's research in the field has served to influence policy. Um, and secondly, which narratives seem to work best when you present this type of research as citizens, what tends to trigger action? Well, Clarissa said a hard one, um, but I think what we could certainly say is that the whole agenda has been taken far more seriously um, ever since COVID-19. People realize just how catastrophic a single event spreading globally can be. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, some of us have been trying to do recently has been to uh, interest um, parliamentarians in our country in this. And um, as you may know, uh, young people at CESA set up a special parliamentary group to address the welfare of future generations. And we now have another uh, group like a one year select committee in the House of Lords is going to take evidence and make recommendations on how to uh, reduce the um, uh, uh, reduce the impact and increase the preparedness for 
various kinds of catastrophes. Uh, so certainly these issues that we've helped to uh, um, raise on the agenda are being taken much more seriously. And I think that's gratifying. I also think that it's very important that we should try and interact with a wide community, young people, obviously, but also uh, those who may have a, a independent voice. It shouldn't be just academics making these uh, uh, proposals. Good, Th thank you, Martin. It's... Okay, well, I, I've seen one question come up, which seems a bit of a follow on to that. So this is someone uh, called Coleman Snell, um, who's joining us from the US. He's wondering about effective practices that can be implemented at universities um, to get undergraduates involved. Well, I mean, I think um, to make undergraduates aware of these sorts of issues is crucially important. Um, and uh, this can be done, obviously, as part of the curriculum, um, partly by all kinds of meetings and partly by uh, encouraging demonstrations and things of that kind uh, and student politics. Um, I think um, uh, I mentioned that um, I go back to the um, uh, 1960s when I was a student and uh, um, I was in CND that campaign. And one thing I've realized is that uh, although the student campaigns of those generations uh, were um, regarded as sort of uh, aggro by many people, uh, they were on the whole right. They were sort of anti-CND, uh, um, anti, um, anti, um, C, well, um, free Nelson Mandela, anti-apartheid, anti-Vietnam, uh, gay rights and all those uh, which have become conventional. And so um, I think if students have a campaign, one shouldn't dismiss it. One should realize that perhaps they're just uh, 30 years ahead of older people. Thank you. Yes, I guess that we've seen particularly recently with Extinction Rebellion as well. That that's sort of I don't go all the way with them, I have to say, but I think I think they um, they're counterproductive sometimes. But I think to enthuse young people with massive demonstrations is important. So, and I don't, don't necessarily want um, our staff to, to hog the questions, but I noticed Simon Beard, another difficult one for me, but um, <laughs> he's asking whether you consider that you've won your long bet with Steven Pinker, um, that a bio-terror or bio-error would lead to one million casualties in a single event in a six-month period, uh, no later than the end of this year. Um, uh, well, I, I think I've, I've won it morally, but I've lost it technically, um, because uh, um, uh, uh, he, he is, of course, uh, um, someone who's always very optimistic. Um, he's written very good books where he plots how everything's getting better, life expectancy, education, literacy, and all the rest of it. And he's right about that, but he doesn't take account of the new class of threats, uh, which uh, loom over us now, which didn't in the past. So I think he, he underestimates them. In this particular case, um, I uh, put in a proviso that the um, pandemic I was worried about would be created by error or by terror. And although some people think that uh, uh, this pandemic started in the Wotan uh, laboratory, most people don't. So I think technically I lose my bet, but uh, it's far worse than the kind of thing I was originally, uh, originally thinking of, which would have had uh, a thousand uh, cases, whereas this had far more than a thousand, uh, sorry, a million cases, whereas this has had more than a million fatalities. Thank you. Um... So the next one that's come up is from Amanda Sandberg um, from the Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, he's saying that there's a number of new risks that are being discovered each decade. Uh, roughly how many existential risks do you think we're currently unaware of, but in danger from? Um, and he suggests that might be one big one, uh, 10, a thousand little ones. Um, well, I, I don't know. And uh, um, Anders is a much more imaginative person on these subjects than anyone else I know in the field. So if Anders can't think of it, then I certainly won't be able to. That's very difficult. But I think one, one important point, which I did mention in my, my talk, is that uh, um, things could happen far worse than anything on our current risk register. I mean, you know, something which is a, as transmissible as COVID-19, but as fatal as Ebola, for instance, things of that kind. Um, and so we've got to be mindful that there could be far worse things that could happen. And also, we can't really um, say they're that improbable. Um, sometimes people say, well, less than one in 100,000 per year or something like that, whereas the probability per year 
is changing year by year. Um, all these things are more likely in a, a year, 10 years from now than they are today. And so I, I do think we need to be seriously worried that there will be a new class of threats, which in our more technically advanced and more interconnected world will be more damaging a decade or two from now than they are today. I mean, obviously, I, one mustn't forget that there'll be vaccines, and etc., which will also develop. But still, um, there's an arms race, as it were, um, between the, um, uh, the defenders um, and, uh, and the, new, the new threats. Just as, incidentally, in, the, in, in cyber warfare, there's an uh, arms race between um, the uh, um, uh, cybersecurity people and the cyber attackers, because both are now aided by AI. Thank you, Martin. And I think that speaks a lot to, to what you were saying about the importance of us improving our ways of, of governing and handling the sort of preparedness, but becoming more resilient to, to any threat uh, that we might face. So there's another couple of questions come in. Um, so one is from Victoria Lenowitz. Um, so I'll just re read the statement first that her amateur guess that what motivated cathedral builders was community effort and clear, steady employment for its builders, rather than the anticipation of the end result for future generations. How do we develop really strong community based motivation to tackle these long term questions now? Uh, many leaders seem to be more inclined to be divisive than working on community bonds focused on solving long term problems. Yes. Well, good to hear from Vicky. And uh, as I know, she would agree, there's a lot of work to be done in the United States um, at, at the moment to uh, to build up th these uh, these feelings. But I do think more seriously that um, um, it is hard to uh, generate very long term feelings because we do know how rapidly things are changing, as I mentioned in my talk, that it, it is harder um, to make people think about what will happen. Um, although uh, they do care on the whole about what will happen in the lifetime of their grandchildren, so ought to care for that. But I think the most important thing to get community feeling um, has to be to uh, reduce inequalities, which, uh, as you know, have grown in particular, the top 1% running away and people left in poverty in rich countries. So we need, I think, to uh, get more common feeling in, um, uh, in countries of the, uh, of the West and the North. But of course, I do really think that we've got to do something to um, help Africa, because um, I know we're going to hear from some experts on Africa, but the, the problem for Africa is that uh, um, it's in poverty now and it's just been trapped there because um, if their population keeps on growing, they may be in the poverty trap and they can't leap forward the way the East Asian tigers did by cheap manufacturing because robots are doing that. That's being reshored in some ways. So uh, they don't have the opportunity. And so I really do think that in our interests as well as theirs, there needs to be some sort of mega Marshall plan, which ensures that uh, the economy of uh, Africa and other parts of the world that are now disadvantaged doesn't lag behind. Because if it does lag behind, that's a recipe for massive disruption in the second half of the century. Uh, so that's the uh, view I'd offer to, uh, um, to Vicky to uh, ensure that the next American president, unlike the present one, uh, is sympathetic to the idea that uh, America ought to lead in breaking down these distinctions between the uh, wealthy countries and the possibly left behind developing countries. Thank you, Martin. I think you've probably answered the, the next question as well, which is from Sonia Amade, but I'll also state this one. Yeah, she yeah. said she appreciated the consideration of global structural injustices contributing to existential risk. And with regard to this, what are some of the most optimistic scenarios for addressing this? Do they have a grassroots bottom-up structure or a top-down elite management structure? Well, obviously, to be effective, there's got to be a bottom-up element. Um, but uh, just to take one example, which uh, I briefly alluded to, um, uh, getting clean energy and more efficient agriculture. Uh, this is something where, um, you know, um, some countries and Cambridge University is very big on plant science, etc., that can help. But if we're going to try to help developing uh, nations, then... Uh, it should not be neo-colonialism, we should work with them. Uh, so I think we should uh, uh, do what we can to build up the efforts in those countries in the kind of R&D which is needed 
if they are to get um, uh, adequate food without encroaching on forest space, etc., and also uh, clean and affordable energy. So I think there are these obvious goals, which are in their interest and in our interest to go carbon free is one of them. And I think uh, the wealthy countries um, could help in this way um, and uh, build up communities in less developed countries. It shouldn't be top down from the rich countries to the poor countries, certainly. Thank you. I, I'm going to cluster two uh, questions together now that, that are asking sim similar things. So um, uh, Sia Mian is asking um, about this thing about changing the fundamental structure. So is it time to be changing the fundamental structures and the balance between national and global governance in the light of ongoing failure to understand and address existential and near existential risks? And uh, Nancy Connell is similarly asking, so she says it seems that you feel that we're in a worse state in 2020 than in 2003, particularly in bio, what is some of the ideas or models for global governance and oversight that you find feasible? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, some important nations have been rather um, hostile to the idea of uh, uh, international bodies. Um, and I think we need to reverse that attitude because um, uh, the World Health Organization, um, although it's done some good, um, has not proved itself powerful and effective enough to do the optimum uh, um, monitoring of uh, the outbreak of potential pandemics. So the WHO needs to be strengthened um, and um, also the um, um, other bodies like the International Atomic Energy Agency. But I think we probably need more to um, uh, regulate the internet, for instance, because uh, uh, since it's run by international conglomerates, no single nation can do this. So we probably need other b bodies along the lines of the WHO um, to regulate the internet um, and uh, also to um, uh, monitor the shift towards zero carbon um, and see if countries are meeting their pledges. So, so I think we, we do need to um, dilute our sovereignty in these, these areas. Um, I think that's important. And just one other parenthesis, going back to university education, it's very important that um, uh, we have a slightly more educated public in these basic areas, because um, uh, obviously everyone's not going to be a scientist, but if they don't have a feel for these issues um, of climate, environment, uh, etc., which have a scientific dimension, then debate won't get above the level of slogans, and then uh, it won't be so possible to get uh, firm public support. So I think we've got to have some international authorities and a coordinated plan to achieve these goals. Uh, we know we've had the, the UN um, development goals after the Millennium Goals and all that, but we need to have more um, um, goals of that kind and raise their profile and make people care about them more. That's a platitude, but that's all I can say. Thank you, Martin. So Got a couple of questions. Um, so one is giving background. Uh, this is sorry from from Julian Huppert, um, giving the background about prediction being very difficult, uh, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, mentioning the Global Health Security Index on, um, on pandemic preparedness and how highly it rated the US and the UK, um, but they have not since performed very well. Um, and in fact, there seems to be a negative correlation between um, pre-COVID preparedness rating and what's gone on since, um, but, it, but he then generalizes to the question of how can we be sure that we're accurately predicting what works uh, to tackle existential threats. Um, and a related question from Stephen Luby is asking, what has surprised you most about the COVID pandemic? Yes, mm -hmm. well, I think, and probably Julian's thinking of this, um, there, there was a preparedness for a influenza pandemic there had been a, a lot of preparation stocking up on vaccines, etc., cetera, um, but uh, not for the rather different consequences of COVID, which are twofold. First, it needs a lot of protective equipment. And secondly, there's no guarantee of a rapid vaccine, although it does seem that things are going to be slightly optimistic on that front. Uh, and so we weren't prepared and that's generally accepted. And uh, if you look at the um, British published National Risk Register for 2017, it uh, says that uh, an influenza pandemic is a very high risk, but it says that disease X, thinking of something else like that, might kill 100 people. 
this is completely the wrong way around. And so I think uh, we do need to be more prepared and we need to, to uh, be prepared to spend more money and not waste it. I mean, to give an example, um, in I think it was the 2009 uh, um, flu pandemic, it was thought it might be serious and our government stocked up with 400 billion pounds worth of vaccines and they weren't needed. And the relevant minister was berated for wasting money. And that was unfair because obviously you've got to pay an insurance premium and uh, and prepare for different kinds of uh, threats. They won't all happen. And um, I think we realize in retrospect that since um, I read, read some estimate that the global cost of COVID-19 over the next five years is going to be between 10 and 20 trillion dollars worldwide, then in that perspective, then it would have been worth spending hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide in preparedness. And we certainly weren't because no one could have said it was terribly unlikely. It wasn't a one in a hundred thousand year event. We'd had um, various um, influenza pandemics and we had MERS and SARS, two coronaviruses in the last 20 years. And so no one could plausibly have said that the probability per year was much less than one in say 20 or 30 years. And it's an example of a, one of these risks, which is getting more likely year by year because of the uh, uh, more densely packed population and all the rest of it. Thank you. Um, just looking through which, which are being coming up next. So you wouldn't be surprised we have several, <laughs> several questions waiting. Uh, we've got a few more minutes, so we'll go through. Um, so this is from Natalie Jones, who's another one of the postdoctoral researchers at CESA. Uh, focusing on the example you mentioned of Michael Gove banning plastic straws um, after the public awareness raised by Blue Planet 2. Um, so environmental scientists tell us that while straws contribute less than 1% to marine plastic pollution, greater than 10% comes from abandoned fishing equipment. Um, and in this light, do you think industry pressure could be in tension with public pressure um, when it comes to influencing politicians to act on risks? Um. Very much so. And I think um, uh, the public also can have pressure on industry. And I think um, uh, uh, we do know that there's been a sort of change of heart on behalf of at least some of the fossil fuel companies, you know, BP and Shell, etc. Um, and that's been brought about by public pressure, um, divestment campaigns and student protests and things of that kind. So, so I think uh, uh, it's got to be um, go government um, uh, pressure, but also uh, it's a case when the, the public can directly influence the um, uh, big companies, as well as influence the government, which will then in influence the public. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Thomas Homer Dixon of the Cascade Institute. Could you comment on the potential interaction effects between what might be regarded as discrete threats? Uh, so how might sub existential risks combine to create an existential risk? Um, well, I think the various scenarios, I mean, uh, one which you might hear about later in the meeting is um, uh, a combination of uh, cl climate change um, leading to um, uh, um, problems of uh, starvation and loss of biodiversity, etc. Those are two natural risks which feed on each other and could be serious. Um, I think um, the, the other point I'd make is that um, if, well, as I mentioned half jokingly in my talk, I mean, if the internet um, uh, and the electricity grid went down during this month, it would almost certainly lead to a serious breakdown of social order. And uh, th that would not be global, but I think you can imagine that uh, uh, the whole organization of society, which is so fragile, uh, could be vulnerable. And I think um, in order to risk the non-zero chance of a cascade that does lead to the sort of irreversible um, decline in our civilization. Um, one change, and again, this is going back to what industry should do, is to um, uh, balance differently the trade-off between um, efficiency and resilience. And to take one example, um, one of the problems is um, just-in-time delivery, uh, when you get parts uh, from different parts of the world and one link in the supply chain can screw up the whole manufacturing. And that's very, um, uh, efficient, but on the other hand, um, it's not very resilient. It's far more resilient to have several supply chains and keep a, uh, an inventory in stock, etc. Um, and so I think um, there will be a tendency for companies to uh, uh, 
be more resilient in their operations because they've known just how catastrophic it can be uh, if they are um, uh, at the limit of uh, what they can do because they've been trying to be as uh, efficient and economical as possible. Yeah, and I certainly think that's something else that's been made clear by the current situation that we've right. found with the pandemic, the problems with supply chains um, have become very obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so another question. Um, so, um, again, I think there's two, li two linked up here. So, um, Sonia Am Amade is also asking about the existential risk posed by nuclear weapons, um, saying it seems that absurd that in the name of national security preparations to fight nuclear war are ongoing um, and do you have any insights into how con to convince politicians and the military industrial complex to put their energies into other directions uh, and they uh, sort of related question from from Jens Orbach about um, we, we've talked about the multilateral institutions but they don't many countries and leaders don't seem interested in strengthening those institutions um, so what do you think about the, the idea of sort of clubs for the willing? Um, well, I mean, clubs for willing, that's been discussed in, for instance, the uh, case for carbon tax, when they can uh, um, have a club with a carbon tax and they impose tariffs on outsiders, so that's fine. Uh, so it's a good idea. But of course, the bad news is that the, um, uh, uh, the, the recent nuclear treaty has now um, been signed by enough um, uh, nations to... Uh, uh, to, to bring it into effect, but it's not been signed by any of the nuclear nations, so it's not going to be very effective. And and so um, there is, um, there's got to be something else. And of course, I, I did um, talk about the 60s and the 50s when I was too young. There, but it's extraordinary how sort of cavalier and risky everyone was back then. It's quite extraordinary, um, and uh, uh, we were indeed lucky to escape the catastrophe. And that catastrophe um, would have um, de devastated the whole fabric of uh, Europe and North America, certainly. Um, and as I said, could have gone global if there'd been a nuclear winter. And that is the kind of thing which could have been an irreversible setback to civilization by hundreds of years. Um, and um, uh, I, I, the good news is that things now can't be quite as bad as that because the number of nuclear weapons is uh, 10 times less. Um, and so even though there's more chance of some nuclear weapons going off um, in a regional conflict, India, Pakistan or Middle East or um, North Korea or somewhere like that, um, I think there's probably less chance of them going off in a superpower confrontation. Um, and there are fewer weapons by a factor of 10 or so um, than there were um, back in the Cold War. But this is just in abeyance. And what we really have to make sure is that it's not another standoff between new superpowers with a further buildup in nuclear weapons, which is handled less well or less luckily than the old one was. And of course, that raises the question, uh, will um, any future uh, war be um, uh, very different because it will be um, uh, done by robots or done with bio or chemical or things like that? Um, I think not chemical because the, um, sorry, not biological, because um, biological weapons um, are not predictable in their consequences. A bioweapon would only be used by some, someone who uh, thought there were too many human beings in the world and wanted to kill some of them off. Not for anyone with a well-defined goal, but uh, chemical weapons and of course robots uh, could be uh, more dominant. And I think um, uh, one thing which you could say we get confidence is that um, if there's World War III, it'll be over in a few days. That'll be the end of it. And, um, uh, and someone cynically said that uh, World War IV would then be fought with sticks and stones. So that's, uh, that's a very gloomy uh, scenario, but uh, uh, I think the idea of World War III would, be, would get out of control. And of course, um, the, there's the other concern, which of course is being worked on by by um, uh, Shahar people at Caesar, which is that uh, the command and control system um, might be vulnerable to hackers as well. Um, so that's a new kind of uh, accidental war. So uh, it's very scary indeed. 
Um, yes, we'll go with uh, one final question. I know there are another sort of two or three questions <laughs> in the waiting line, but there'll be opportunities to discuss those at other points throughout the conference. So this follows on from the, the, well, it's the same person, Coleman Snell, who asked earlier about um, other budgets and what they could do. Um, it's noting as a young person, he sees climate change fatalism amongst his peers on the rise, which fatalism doesn't often motivate action as much as it motivates despair. And so then the general question, which I think we often reflect on when trying to communicate about our work, is how can existential risk reflect both the true severity of those risks, um, but not just further fatalism? Well, well I think um, to emphasize that um, uh, um, we do have the solutions to these risks, not only improvements in governance, but improvements in technology. Um, uh, we do know, and here Stephen Pinker is quite right in saying that uh, uh, we couldn't have uh, um, 7.8 billion people living as well as many of them do now um, if we had 19th century technology. Uh, and so technology has been a huge benefit for health, food production and everything else. And uh, it could continue that way. There's no reason why the net benefit of new technology shouldn't continue to be positive, um, but the stakes are getting higher. Um, the opportunities are getting more and more fantastic, but the threats are getting higher. So it's just going to be harder to control um, the rate of progress so that we can harness the benefits and minimize the downsides. But I, I think the reason for optimism for young people, um, I, I think to uh, get into a career where one um, tries to um, use a technology which is beneficial in one of these ways, um, is an inspiring career and there are many, many opportunities, more than ever before, I would say for that. Great, and um, that's led us to a, a more positive <laughs> end to the questions. So that, that's yeah. great. Thank, thank you again, Martin. Um, I'd just like to let people know that we are going into a break now that lasts for about half an hour, but you will need to log into the session one <laughs> section of the website to get to the um, next, recordings and talks um, we can't just follow on with the same link okay thank you again martin well, thank you very much thank you